Please welcome number 17, Wendell Clark. How are you doing, man? Go ahead, good to see you. Welcome. You, um, I always love having you in the red chair. You, listen, you, you have one of the best backyard rinks in your own life, but the idea of Hockeyville or, and, and building a rink in another neighborhood has got to be really exciting for you. Well, it's exciting. We're actually, uh, with Craft Hockeyville, we're creating and actually establish making a newer rinks. Like, it's uh, refurbishing the old rinks and making them up to date, so it's more fun to be there as a parent. You, you build the rinks, you think they last forever, but you got to refurbish them, keep them up. Uh, the local communities, that's the, the center. That's where everybody goes to find anybody in a local community in the wintertime. You start at the rink yeah. and then look out. Sure, and in a lot of parts of the country, it's an old curling rink that was used as a hockey rink. It's, it becomes a multi-purpose facility. Well, yeah, and all the small communities, the curling rink and the skating rink are all attached. And the parents walk into the curling rink, uh, the kids walk into the skating rink, and the reason is the curling rink has the liquor license. <laughs> <laughs> are, are you a good curler? I, I've done a lot of curling growing up. My, yeah. my mom and my grandparents all curled. My dad didn't like curling. He, he said all the lazy people curled and the rest of us played hockey. Right. Tell me about Clark Gardens. Clark Gardens, well, I built a little rink when I retired because they wouldn't let me play at the big level anymore, so I built my own rink and got to be my own Zamboni driver. Yeah. And, uh... The Zamboni's awesome, by the way. See? It's like a John Deere tractor pulling a bucket is what it is. Yeah, I, grew up, I grew up to be a Zamboni driver, but, uh, you know, everybody always thinks it's great outside, you beautiful skating outdoors, but you get sick of shoveling. Yeah. Snows every day, you got to shovel the rink off. So I put a roof over it and a little hot stove lounge there, watch the games on Saturday night, and the nice. kids are on the ice. What do you remember from those days when you, when you, were, you first met Mr. Ballard and first became? Because that guy was, what a character. Well, he was the, probably the main character here in Toronto uh, when I first got here. And, and probably just walk into Maple Leaf Gardens, the hot stove. Uh, you walk in the side door, you'd never guess that's one of the best restaurants in town. You're walking through the hot stove in the gardens. And then you're walking out into the ice and just playing. And the one end, that's the bunker where Harold and King Clancy sat for every game that you watched on TV. Then you're actually watching those two guys. Uh, they look like the two old guys in the Muppets there sitting at the end of the, <laughs> end of the building. But that, that, that was the, the guys at the end of the rink. And, and they were such a big part of He'd be signing autographs and waving to the fans, and uh, it was a big part of playing in the garden. When, when you were going through contract negotiations, did you ever uh, accidentally fire the puck in that direction? <laughs> no, the glass was just too high. <laughs> That's right. But it was uh, a, lot of, a lot of good memories uh, with the gardens and the history and, and being able to play uh, in a building. Any of the old original six buildings, whether you played in Montreal and Toronto and Boston, all these starring buildings had a history to them, and they were the best buildings to play in. The game had a different kind of personality back then. What do you think has been the key difference uh, in the personality of the game? Well, I think because everything got more intense. As the money got bigger, everything became a bigger job. Everything was more serious. Uh, each player is his own little company now. Where uh, it, Before, you, you got there, you're, it seemed closer. Uh, there was less security. Uh, remember, the glass was only this high. You could reach over and grab the fans yeah. uh, on the other side of the glass. <laughs> um, That's got to be fun, so though, right? Closer, uh, you know, there's probably, when I started, there's still, I think, 20 10 to 20 guys not wearing helmets. And right. that was the big thing uh, for identifying players that made it visual to a lot of fans was you could really see who your favorite player was. You know, Guy Lafleur going down the ice, hair flowing. Uh, so those kind of things really brought the fans really close. Where today with more protection, more bigger helmets, more equipment, goalies dressed up, the, the, you don't really identify to the players quite like you used to in the old days. Do you, do you think that... There's truth to the story that the bigger the and the harder the equipment, that that's one of the reasons why the game is less safe. A body check just smokes uh, a gun. Yeah, the, the game today is is way less violent. You can't get away with stuff because the ref. In the old days, the ref couldn't find you, and their TV games weren't everywhere. There was no video replay. If you did something behind the play to get away, with, you get away with it. Yeah. Where today, you can't get away with anything. Uh, but the game is so much faster. They're so much bigger, and the equipment's so much better. So the collision is that much harder. Uh, so, so it's that, actually rougher. That if you're going to body check me in 1987, I die. If you body check me today with the equipment I'm wearing, I'm going to die, but it'll last a week on life support. Like, it's just the... Well, they can keep you alive longer now. They that, sure that's can. technology. <laughs> but, but, but would you have hit... Would players have hit as hard wearing the equipment that you guys wore when you first broke into the league? You wouldn't because you, were, you would have been... And a lot of times you'd have been said, I'm going to hurt myself throwing that check because your equipment wasn't as good. Where today, and starting from the kids on up, the kids feel invincible. They're, they're dressed like gladiators, and I'm on the ice teaching the kids. they got helmets and masks and neck guards, mouth guards. You can't even talk to them in line. They are <laughs> spitting a mouth guard out. And, and so you're so well protected, they feel invincible. 
And what happens is they actually forget to respect themselves because they think, oh, I can't get hurt. Mm -hmm. and, and that's probably one of our biggest things, isn't that we've lost respect for the other guy? Uh, in playing hockey as kids, we've lost respect for ourselves and saying, I can't put myself in that situation. Uh, because we're so well protected as kids and players, at the, even at the NHL level, uh, you're not watching out for yourself as much. You just think that I can't get hurt, I've got all this equipment on. When you were playing, did you ever think that, you know, when you got wiped out, you had to get off because that's what a tough guy does. A tough guy has to skate off even though in your own mind you're like, just stay down. Uh, yeah, you didn't want to stay down. You didn't want the 18,000 fans in the visiting building to have something happy said that you're laying on the ice. So <laughs> you could be dying out there and you're getting off the ice. And, and a lot of things, even when I'm coaching my kids now, unless they're really hurt, they have to come off the ice. You do that? I, get off the ice! Unless you're, because I want to know if, I, if our trainer's going on the ice or if I'm the guy that has to go on the ice, I want to know you're hurt so that I, know, I treat it properly. Right. But it's, it, it's like crying wolf if you're not really hurt all the time and you're going out, then all of a sudden maybe the trainer does not go out very serious and, and he has got a bad injury. So if you, if you get hurt, uh, it's, it's better to get off the ice and get treated. You're coming closer uh, to the doctor and the trainers faster. So if you are really hurt, it actually is going to help you to get to the medical staff quicker. Stick around more with Wendell Clark right after this. like when you saw your number get lifted to the rafters in Toronto? Uh, that, that was probably the highlight or the, the one of the best things is after playing a long career, 15 years and 13 of it in Toronto, to be able to uh, watch that banner go up where you played, it, it put me you know up there and you're just honored to be a part of that building. You're up there with uh, the Salmings, the Sittlers and Johnny Bowers and, and those guys are the guys you looked up to. So mm -hmm. um, that was probably the biggest honor uh, that I had at that stage of my career. Does Movember have to give you a cut every year? Every year. Because it used to be they wanted to grow the landing, now they want to grow the Wendell, the Wendell yeah. you know? No, that's, uh, that, that, that's the thing. At the end of your career and you get to do that and you're officially stamped as old. You're up there with the rest of the guys. <laughs> do you know that your time is coming before they do? Like, do you know that even though we want to stay in play in our, whatever we choose in our life as long as possible, are there things happening on the ice where you're going in your head, oh, God, I got to, I got to... Um, yeah, there, for me, it was my body. It's when you can't bend over to tie your skates anymore. You go, you know, that next season's not going to be that good. So uh, at the end of the year, uh, my last year in Toronto in 2000, uh, the last playoff game I played, I think, was game we lost in, in the series to New Jersey, game four, my last game in Toronto, and the next day I couldn't play for the next game. So right. it, it, it was just my body was at the end of... Uh, recovering at age 32, 33, so I knew that was done. And, and sometimes it's easier to retire when your body says you can't go. I want to talk to you about uh, the stuff involving concussions. And um, you know, about, I know it's relatively new, but you're hearing players, guys that you played with, starting to mount this campaign, which says, "Hey, we think that we weren't done right by." Did you ever? How many concussions do you think you suffered? I had one major one that I know of. I probably had a few little ones, but you didn't really know then. And nobody, I don't think. New to extent, I had one when I got traded to Quebec. Uh, my last exhibition game in '94, in uh, I got a concussion, and uh, I spent the night in the hospital. And then that next morning, it was a lockout, so we didn't play till January. So uh, it had the season started in October, I wouldn't have played for 40 games. Wow! So nobody really knows that I had a concussion that long, because I would I would have been out 40 games. So I understand what they're going through, but because of the lockout, I never never had to get known about it. Did you suffer after the symptoms started to fade? Did you notice things in you change? Yeah, no, as you're going through the different stages, you went from the, probably the first two weeks after my concussion, I spent in my apartment with the lights out, no TV on, like couldn't do anything. And then you just get to, to walking and then sound, you couldn't watch TV with your eyes, you couldn't read. Uh, so you had to go through all those stages to get back uh, to playing again, but uh, it all got back to normal again, but it, it took time. Did you ever doubt that you'd be able to get back out? Uh, no, it was just time, but uh, probably because I had time because the teams weren't playing, so you weren't in that rush. So I didn't put that extra pressure on yourself. Oh, geez, I've missed another game and another game. So um, it, it, it wasn't as bad, I think, because of the lockout. Nobody was playing, so you just al allowed yourself to get that rest. So it might have been different had I been missing the 40 games. Do you think that you'd, you'd get involved in a lawsuit like that? 
I don't think so. I, the, the game's been so good to me. It's tough to, tough to say uh, that I would be involved with that, but I'm not judging anybody by it. It's yeah. just my personal opinion. You know Stevie, Stevie Y, you played with them briefly. I think your kids seem to know each other, yeah. at least the Twitter accounts. Um, <laughs> but the, w w what do you make of his mind? This is the guy that we kind of look at and go, okay, what do you got for us, Stevie? Well, it's, it's, there's nobody that thinks the game more than him, uh, probably quietly, and analyzes and analyzes players and the game and and so he's going to put together uh, who he thinks is the best group he's going to take information from everybody uh, he's a very smart guy that way and in taking all the knowledge from all the guys around him and 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 use all the expertise to hopefully make the decisions that uh, make us win a gold medal he um you know that moment when, when, when he won a stanley cup where people went steve eisman won a cup and you always hear about how that is the defining moment for a person if they don't win a cup their career is defined by that but i know when you talk to players years after they retire that they find that the experience was good enough. And winning a cup is so difficult in the first place. How do you look back at your career, and does the cup or not cup define the view of your career? Uh, it, it can in some ways, I guess, because that, that's the ultimate goal, but it's the ultimate team goal. Uh, the ultimate team goal is winning the Stanley Cup. You're not going to judge uh, guys solely on that. Uh, you know, you're not going to change what you think of Daryl Sittler because he yeah. didn't win a Stanley Cup because he's still one of the best uh, well, that the Marcel played. Dion run the that Marcel Dion's, uh, all those points. So you can't judge solely because, you, you know, timing was you weren't on the team that was good enough to win. So you can't say yeah. uh, all of that. But it's, it's something where it really helps to define and get you there. If you can be a part of that team and then you can be the leader like Stevie is of that team to win those cups, uh, there's nothing better than that. Right. the newsmen write it, it'll be wrong, but on the other hand, it's the truth. We've got the number one draft choice, and he comes well recommended by our scouts, managers, and anybody that has anything to do with selecting hockey players. The, uh, that moment, you know, and I'm sure you've, you've thought much about it and talked about it, but just that moment when this kid from a town of 900 or whatever shows up and is like, this is Toronto. And here I am, first overall, expectations. So the team was okay at best at the moment. And you, you came in with all this pressure. What, did I, what, what, was that, what was going through your head in that moment? Uh, probably just trying to make the team, because I remember Harold drafting me. He says, what happens if you don't make it? <laughs> <laughs> Harold said in the first one, I signed the contract in the summer. Uh, but it's, uh, it's, you probably don't understand the pressure at 18 as much as people think you do. Uh, but at 18, you probably have less pressure than you do at 25. Because at 18, everything, when I was there at 18 years old, everything you did every day was new. You know, you're in the dress room in blue and white jersey. Everything's perfect every day. Uh, you could lose 5 nothing, and it's, I'm still playing in the NHL. Yeah. Like, I'm not playing back home anymore. So it's not as bad as you think. But the guys that have been in the league five, six years ago, they understand the pressures. They pick up the papers. We're really getting it today type thing. Uh, they understand it more. But the young, when you're younger and you're 18, 19, you're just so happy to be there. You finally got there. Um, it doesn't feel as bad, the losses, as it does once you've been there and you want to get the, to win the big cup. Um, over your career, you've had a chance to play with some incredible players and some great goalies, too. Reggett made big saves. remember seeing Felix that first year, massive saves, Cujo saves. When the players go to congratulate a goalie, what are you saying to them when they've made what is clearly... A game-saving moment. What do you say to them? It's actually, it's easiest just to say nothing and pat them and get out of there in a hurry. Yeah. Because, because really, the, the the goalie. You hate to put the, that kind of pressure on him, but the goalie is the most instrumental part of your hockey team. He is uh, the psyche, the confidence. Everything on your whole bench goes by how he's playing. Uh, especially if you're an average team, a good goalie will make you a good team. If you're a great team then it's tough, you can't beat that team. And that's a, a bad team, a guy can make the team average. That goalie is a difference in the whole team. A goal scorer is a better goal scorer when he's got that goalie. But you don't want to get in their head because goalies are also notoriously very strange. They are, they're very, very strange. Yeah. <laughs> what are we gonna do for Sochi? We're approaching the games, the Olympic games. This is one of those years where we don't have a surefire number one goalie. We're past the Brodeur dominance era and now we have questions about who our goalie could be. How do you feel about Team Canada? Well, maybe it's a, a good thing. Maybe it's a good thing that the one guy, whoever it is, is going to step up and be the guy. Just be that guy. Because uh, the one thing about the Olympics or World Championship or any of these tournaments, it's not like a playoff that starts in April and ends in June. Uh, it's something where you've got to be great for two weeks. Yeah. 
it's a it's a one, bunch of one-off games, and and so not all all the time that the best goalie in the world is the best goalie for two weeks, and, and so we just have to have that guy that's the best guy for for two weeks. It's a different kind of a tournament. It's not like a playoff. All right, anthropology for Wendell Clark. If you're watching TV and you stumble on a movie, you're not changing the channel. Which movie is it? I don't know. Probably Slapshot. No yeah. matter how many times it's on. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody, it's such a yeah. It's so good. Which romantic comedy are you staying on? Oh, I don't know. I, I can't, uh, Do you cry at movies? Uh, no. No? <laughs> my, 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 my kids try to get me to go to movies. I don't go to movies. No? No. So is Slapshot the best sports movie of all time? I, I think so. If you're a hockey guy, it really takes it back to that, that era of, for us, probably uh, 80s, 80s guys. That you watch hockey that was just ahead of us, but yet it kind of uh, was a little bit like we grew up. And so it, it takes you back there. What's the one perk? about being the captain of an original six team that we wouldn't know? Um, it's, it's probably the hugest honor because it's, it's the, the team in Canada, Toronto Maple Leafs, and, and your, uh, the, your peers allow you to be captain and, and you're a part of that room. You're, uh, the good thing is you're answering all the questions. The bad thing is you're answering all the questions. Right. <laughs> you can't take everything personally uh, all the time, like Dion's going through. Sometimes where he takes things personally, you think you know, he doesn't take it personal, but people think, oh, they're picking on Dion, but they're really not. The media and the fans are going at because he's the captain, so they're really picking on the team. How come you're not being good enough? And that's the captain sometimes takes that heat, but also when you're winning, the captain gets raised to another level as well. So there's it's a double-edged sword when you're wearing a, a C in any of the original six. You never want to call him and say, "Listen, I love it when you throw those big checks, but try not to be out of position after you finish the check." No, no. I, it, <laughs> one thing you do as an ex-hockey player, you don't critique other ones unless you're on the <laughs> media side of it, uh, because you understand what they're going through. Because right. when we all played, we all made mistakes and that was all part of it. You're, as many good things as happen, you're going to make lots of bad things happen. How many times during the Rob Ford scandal did Ty Domi call you and tell you he wishes he was the mayor? <laughs> <laughs> probably none, and probably stayed away from all that stuff. Did. Did you, when, how many times during the Rob Ford scandal did you think, you know what, I'm Wendell Clark, I could have been mayor. <laughs> no, I'm glad I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> you got to watch Craft Hockeyville. Wendell's a part of it. Craft Hockeyville 2014. Nominations are now open, right? Go to crafthockeyville.cbc.ca. It's always a pleasure to see you, number sure. 17. Thank you. Wendell Clark.